Hi, Heather. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Oh, yeah. down. I am going to. It's just one of those days. Can't quite get it right, but whatever. You know, I wish people could see me. <laughs> uh, okay. She just let me in and then. Yeah, you have to open up your camera and you got your mic open, obviously. Well, yeah, I already agreed to all the settings. That's what I don't understand is I showed Heather how to do it. <laughs> so. Well, we can hear you at least. I so am. It's not showing my kick it off, right? Oh, She's going to kick it off then kick it off to me and then you're going to pass it to you. Chandra says she can't hear either of us. Travis can, Chase can. Natasha can, everyone else can. I think we're live. Rachel, kick it off. Well, kick it off when they say we're live. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, no. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Should I just X out? Maybe I should, should I X out of Zoom? Okay. Well, I think we're live and should kick this off. Heather, I'll introduce you. Um, sure. I'm David Matthews with RevTech Ventures in Dallas. Oh, Rachel's back. I know, I Take finally it away, made Rachel. it. So, yeah. Well, cool. Well, I mean, I can introduce Heather if you want to go on ahead. You're welcome to as well. So, um, cool. Well, I'll go ahead and dig in. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to introduce both Heather Hildebrand and David Matthews of Accenture and RevTech Ventures, respectively. So Heather is actually the managing director of Accenture Interactive. And one thing really interesting about her is she's seen both the Fortune 500 retailer side, but also worked on the startup side as well. So not only understands how to build solutions that actually help drive the industry forward, but at the same time can drive a perspective on how to actually implement things and how to work with retailers that are looking at buying these solutions. Um, and, and I'll let her share a little bit more, but also, David, is I've had the pleasure of working for and and really has a great perspective on where the industry is headed and always sees things at least 10 years out. Um, so excited for this discussion and I'll good let morning. you two take it from here. So, yeah, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here today. Can you all hear me? OK, Yeah. awesome. All right. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, um, I'm an MD from Accenture Interactive. I lead our consumer business in the South, and we focus on retail, CPG, travel, and auto industries in my group. Uh, Accenture Interactive, we're a digital agency inside of Accenture. We focus on creating new customer experience through design, marketing, and innovation. Uh, Rachel mentioned my startup experience. I've been in Austin, and since 2000, I've been in the startup community Started at Trilogy, PC Order in the very early days of .com. I was at HomeAway before and after, and during and after uh, its IPO. I was with uh, Spreadfast when it was uh, it's a social media company when it was just you know um, just under 100 people and now is named Koros. So I'm excited to be here today. These are really unusual times, but retail is by far one of the most dynamic industries today because retailers really own the path to the consumer which is a critical path, especially today when we need to serve consumers in new ways that's so critical to businesses and, and to the consumer. And as we know, businesses will thrive on the consumer experiences they create and retail is well positioned for innovation. Entrepreneurial businesses like yours will help reinvent the consumer experiences and how retailers meet the demands of a very different consumer than ever before. Excited to share, have Dave Matthews as well. Um, David, you want to do a um, bit more of an intro and then we'll do, I'll start asking you some good questions. Sure, I'm David Matthews, Managing Director at RevTech Ventures in Dallas. My background is all in retail and technology and investing. And at RevTech, I get to put all three things together, but 
We've done now 48 investments in retail technology over the last eight years and um, and are really just starting to hit our stride in, in terms of uh, companies we've invested in really scaling and growing and thriving. Awesome. Okay, so I'll start asking David some questions on industry and then we can start on the retail industry as well as you know, starting your businesses and getting investment and then we'll shift to some Q&A. All right, so as far as macro industry trends, David, let's talk about D2C and e-com for a second. So COVID has definitely interrupted the path to the consumer and many CPGs and retailers and brands which have typically sold wholesale are now creating their own commerce channel. How are retailers protecting their position as the primary path to the consumer? Well, to the degree they've figured out the path of harmonized retail, I, I think they are uh, contending well. Um, we had years where retailers were, um, we're kind of building the e-commerce business completely separate with a different group with different goals and wasn't really connected with the store side of the equation. But over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of ad advancement um, uh, there to, uh, to where it's an integrated solution trying to give the customer a, a uh, excellent experience, whether they're shopping online, offline in the store, or a combination of the two. So I think those retailers that have, that have adapted that harmonized retail model, as Steve Dennis puts it, are, are in the best shape. And those that never quite got that figured out are being le left in the dust. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, so look, so economic times are tough right now. And as a startup, how do they create a path for the customer that's profitable? Well, by having a strong value proposition, so I think that's first and foremost. Um, not just copying what's already out there, but um, but you know, discovering what's not out there that needs to be, and finding a path to bring it to market. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think uh, I think now is really a great time for a startup. Anytime you have a downturn, a recessionary period, and a period of massive disruption where incumbents are going away and going out of business, there's a lot of room for incumbents to come in. Yeah, so I guess I, if I could summarize, identifying unmet needs, right? And in yes. driving, driving innovation through that and really looking at this time as a time for real innovation as an opportunity, not as a reason to, you know, to, to not, uh, you know, drive new business. Yeah. I bet you see a lot too at Accenture with your group. Yes, we do. We definitely do. We see a lot of retailers looking at and brands looking at how they innovate, how they get closer to the consumer. Now, how can a retail uh, retailer or retail startup acquire customers um, and compete with e-commerce giants? And again, I know you want to focus on profitability. Yeah. Could, could I just give a minute and give like what, a quick like 30 second evolution there. And cause first you had the dot com revolution where all these um, uh, brands were created like toys, shoes, whatever apparel, uh, books, video. Uh, and then Amazon really became the category killer and, uh, and became the 800 pound gorilla in e-commerce retail. But then on the heels of that, you had these direct to consumer brands emerging and the way they competed with Amazon is they directly designed and sourced products that you couldn't get on Amazon. So it was unique. Uh, it was a brand and a retailer all in one uh, selling direct to the consumer. So all the way from supply to demand. Now that's pretty well matured. And most of the categories have been claimed by, you know, first, second, third place contenders uh, across the different types of retail. And, and now I see kind of the next wave is, is more of a curation. Uh, so kind of back to basic retailing of merchandising and curating the right mix of products uh, that, that can you can build a brand around. Does that track with you, Heather, with what you see in kind of the evolution of e-commerce? Yeah, I mean, personalization is, I mean, and you talk about cur curation, personalization is definitely something that's, um, becoming really important and you know creating 
you know, creating the a curated experience to deliver on a you know compelling customer experience is um, definitely something that we see now. Um, and D2C, right? D2C is just growing uh, significantly e-commerce, right? Because that is the, the, the path, right? To create, consu- cre- to create a consumer experience uh, right yeah, now, given the quarantine economy, now, right? Yeah, I think it's going deeper now. I mean, we've, we've had well evolved now, like eyeglasses, shoes, foot, uh, you name it. Uh, now, I think the next um, path is really kind of that transparency. People want to know what they're getting, like where it came from and, and feel good about it. And they like items that like have a story. If you're going to be intentional with your purchasing and, and only have a few things, you want to have things that really have a story behind it. And you know, that you kind of have visibility into how and where it was made. Yeah, exactly. For the brands, for sure. Now let's talk about the future of retail. So, you know, COVID, it has changed so many consumer behaviors overnight out of necessity. According to Accenture Research, it'll be 160% increase in e-com purchases from net new or pre-COVID low frequency users because they have because they have to use e-commerce, just like we were talking about. Um, wanted to ask you, David, uh, let's talk about your perspective. After most cities get out of quarantine, will consumers go back to shopping in store? Wow. I- was thinking about this over the weekend, Heather. I think it's very corollary to uh, when and how will people go back to the office again. Uh, I think um, I think the answer is yes, they'll go back to the store, but it's going to be different probably. Um, certainly in the workplace, I think I think there's early indications that workspaces are going to be more for as needed, not like 24/7 be there, um, but for important meetings or activities or connectivity functions. I think retail will be the same way, and it was already on that path anyway. Stores were getting less and less traffic, and e-commerce was growing. You know, stores were growing in low single digits, if at all, and e-commerce was growing in, uh, in you know, sizable double digits. And I think what this year of hibernation has done is it's just really increased those trend lines to where a lot of the platforms that enable e-commerce and e-commerce providers are like feeling like it's 2024 right now as to where they are in their business plan. Yeah, actually that we'll get to that in a minute. Um, what I was going to say is, I mean, or we'll get to the kind of the three to five year lens and how does it change, you know, how's it changing your roadmaps? Um, another question on this though, um, you know, as a startup, how do you balance creating a strategy built on, I think, a perspective shaped with a COVID mindset versus really thinking about the future world that, you know, we don't really know, but, you know, you don't want to make too many decisions based on exactly what COVID has done, though it's made some significant, uh, obviously significant impact in expediting, uh, you know, where brands and retailers really need to go. But what, so one question is like, how do you balance that? And then the other one is just how do you do you, or how do you avoid over rotating maybe to the to the lens of looking at where we are now, knowing that we'll have yeah. probably a balance, right? Um, after. That would be really dangerous, as you say, to over rotate to a COVID lens. Um, I think it is balance. And that's what I was speaking to earlier on like harmonized retail. Uh, harmonized retail is just that between offline and online because a retailer that has stores and and online presence is really in a competitive position i mean look at amazon they um they didn't have any stores and now they have quite a lot of stores just by whole foods market alone Um, and we might look forward in 10 years and they may have thousands of stores but i think you know it's it's dangerous to look through the lens of 2020 and say this is our new normal uh, I think um, I think there's a lot we can glean from it on how an excellent experience, whether you're online or offline or both. Um, but um, you know, we had a pandemic a hundred years ago, and everything went back to normal. What's different this year, I think, is that technology. We have the ability to do what we're doing right at this minute, which is to be together, sharing ideas and information uh, with audio, video, and data, uh, real time. Uh, so. So, you know, these tools are going to have us uh, realizing we can have less commute time 
and better quality of life uh, to, to the extent we balance the online and offline experience in each of our lives. Yeah, exactly. And it's also like a, you know, an opportunity to really test your digital channels and really test new experiences, right? Really see how these unit, how these channels are performing. And then, you know, when you go back to expanding experiences in, in, in person uh, experiences, you've got this online channel really tested out and optimized. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So consumers, so we've talked about this, the consumers have shifted dramatically, right? And, uh, you know, accelerated that three to five year corporate roadmap to something that's near term for, um, for especially in digital to just to reach customers and reach consumers now and really I seeing some of those identified, unidentified and unmet needs and innovating on that. But let's talk in more depth about your perspective around what type of technologies and innovations um, you know, are needed now and in, and in the future. Yeah, well, it's, it's a relentless course of more of the same of, of utilizing AI to better understand the customer, where they are, how they are, why they are, what they want and how you can serve their need. So I think automation stays in high gear, uh, investments we have that are accelerating are uh, like automated store concept where you can check in, grab what you want off the shelf and leave yeah. with no kind of human interaction uh, with uh, inventory management and grocery stores to where, um, to where the monitoring of inventory on the shelves is automated versus, you know, clerks um, scanning barcodes all day. Uh, I think those are relentless. I think increased personalization to where each customer is truly treated uniquely based on how they want to be served, what they're interested in, how they want to be served. Um, I, I, I think we're figuring out the balance between creepy and cool. And, and I think we're, we're accepting that, um, that to the extent our mobile devices and our technology can, uh, can make our lives better for achieving what we want to achieve, getting what we want to get, I think personalization is on a relentless course forward. And then I spoke earlier about supply chain transparency. That's a very interesting area to us of uh, being able to know where your product came from. It's, it's relevant for food. It's relevant for apparel. It's, it's relevant for uh, many uh, categories of retail. And then lastly, I'd say uh, re-commerce is an area that's, uh, that's growing with a lot of traction of, of you know, people want to be intentional with their purchase. Their people are buying less stuff, but the stuff they're buying is more intentional, and they want stuff that things that have meaning, and and they want you know sustainability around that. So items uh, that can be recycled, repurposed, reused. I think we're going to see a lot more about uh, like that. Uh, you know, for years it was kind of Amazon had used books that you could choose new or used books on the site. And then you had eBay, but now through um, all these things, um, uh, we're starting to see a lot more section uh, selection out there, like with Poshmark, uh, the Real Real, Rent the Runway, what have you. Yeah, I see. I can see that. So, um, so speaking of, so marketplaces is another big trend we see, right? Around how do you create more commerce experiences that you know, potentially large retailers are pulling in smaller brands and allowing them to, you know, to sell through their site or, or drive acquisition through the pull of some of these large e-commerce retailers. Are you seeing some of that traction yeah, in, yeah. The, in the startup community? In the startup community? Well, well, last mile delivery was the biggest retail tech theme two years ago, but this past year it shifted to marketplace. And, and I think that shift to marketplace in, included these um, re-commerce places where it's kind of a giant consignment store, if you will. Um, so, so I think marketplace has been a hot one. Now, what the next trend line is, um, I, don't, I think we're trying to figure that out. How have you... Have, what are you thinking about how marketplaces deliver on the promise of personalization? Well, first and foremost is knowing the customer. Uh, you have easy ability now to, um, to uh, pull in the, the purchase data history 
of a customer um, uh, from various POS platforms or Shopify or what have you, um, you have very easy ability because it's kind of table stakes now, the ability to pull in uh, the data of what Heather Hildebrand's bought in Austin and what I've purchased in Dallas and what Rachel is looking at but hasn't purchased yet. It's still sitting in the shopping cart. Uh, we have all that. The next step is really putting filter to, um, you know, a aspirational needs, what people care about. And uh, and so an example of that, you know, we're, we're investing in a company called Bird's Eye that's had a personalization product for independent grocers for years now of where they can feed relevant offers only to the consumer and not irrelevant offers. Um, but they've now layered on that wellness. Textural add-on, their customers can opt in and, uh, and have the offers that are made to them not only filtered on what they buy, but on what they want to buy based on the health, um, the health goals they have. So that's kind of taken what's kind of like current state of the art and what's the next generation state of yeah, the art. Yeah, that's super interesting, especially given that with COVID, it's driven a focus on health and wellness, right? And people want to stay more healthy, yeah. you know, stay healthy, prevent. It's really turned a lens into, you know, how healthy are we and what are we eating and how are we exercising? What kind of access do we have for our, to our exercise driving, you know, Peloton uh, sales? So, yeah, a really good point. Way to go, Peloton. Were they ever in the right place? I know, right kidding. Time? If you were long on Peloton and short on uh, on the uh, fitness gym, you're, you're so. So actually, right question year. though, you said right place, right time, or do you think they were thinking, you know, just well ahead of of where uh, business is going to go? Without COVID, they might have been. Yeah, I think that they were. Early. I think that's the interesting thing with COVID is what it's done is brought, you know, it has, you know, again, we don't want to over rotate to a COVID lens, but what it has done is expedited our plan so that companies that were thinking five years ahead were ready. Right. But, but without COVID, they might've been early. Yeah. Silver lining to everything. But this year you've seen a lot of people that were on the right track for the long term have their plans accelerated. And people that were on the wrong track or brands that were on the wrong, wrong track have have a chance to really regroup and, and yeah, rethink. Exactly. Anything else on technologies and innovations that you want to mention before we get to our next question? No, I do think this year for e-commerce, um, you've really seen a lot of supply chain disruption on um, because of COVID around the world and, and the ability to get products manufactured and, and shipped and, and, and uh, fulfilled. Uh, I think you've seen it, uh, obviously you've seen a giant demand increase. Uh, so there's, uh, there's some drivers. It's interesting if you have supply chain ch challenge and you have a demand increase, uh, you know, what, what kind of implications does that have? Um, and again, it may be um, a temporal distortion, uh, but it has like enabled e-commerce companies to spend less money on advertising this year, for example, uh, while still achieving yeah, larger I mean, volumes. Some... And it probably has driven more substitution and more re-commerce type thoughts. If the product's out of stock, maybe you can find yeah. it secondhand. Gently that does require open some agility box. in your marketing, though, to really refocus your marketing to where, uh, you know, where those products can actually be accessible, right? And thinking about, you know, if, you know, if you think about your, your, your targeting and your personalization and, you know, if the toilet paper is not available in, in this one area, we, we probably shouldn't promote it. And so what we're seeing on our side is more innovation between marketing and supply chain and agility there to align those markets to where the demand and the accessibility right. is. Because, again, you don't want to be promoting products that are, you know, not available. And so that's, you know, required organizations to operate across, you know, what, what might traditionally be more siloed and there are really different parts of the business. Right. And then just one other thing I would add is just social commerce has become, has become really, um, you know, significant. And that one is, will be interesting to see how uh, social commerce uh, becomes part of the overall retail experience. Now I talked about agility. Let's talk about that. So, you know, um, 
brands have had, and retailers have had to innovate their business operations to execute faster, meet supply chain demands, and communicate with the consumer. Uh, st startups are known for nimble and for being nimble and not overly burdened with process. Uh, but how are startups changing to become more agile, either operate internally or work with their partners or, or to engage with consumers? Well, I mean, we're we're here in what's called flyover country for venture capital. So I, th I think through my lens of what I see, the startups have to be very agile, very frugal, very capital efficient, uh, because there's a lot more demand for capital than supply. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, so there's that part of the equation. I think startups, I mean, it's a catch 22. You don't have the problems of a legacy retailer or brand where you have the legacy of your technology, like your POS system or whatever, that, that anchors you to the past and hinders you from being nimble um, <laughs> for serving your customers. Startups don't have that challenge at all. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like um, telecom in the developing world. Uh, the developing world was able to skip putting up poles and wires for telephone networks and just went straight to cellular networks. I mean, it's a similar thing with um, startups in this in this um, e-commerce first world in that you avoid all that legacy. You can be nimble and move faster, but you have to establish credibility. So I'd say now as much as ever, the ability to get a minimum valuable product developed and serving a customer that can be a use case, a referenceable use case for other customers is more important than ever. Because you have the ability to scale really fast in a world where legacy is being penalized, um, but but credibility is like the hindrance for the startup. You don't have the legacy problem, but you have the credibility challenge. So getting to credibility as fast as possible, and you can achieve that through advisory board uh, help. You can achieve that from having smart capital partners that really know the industry that you're competing in. You can achieve that through through uh, no investor or advisor will ever fault a company for buying its first customer, for giving a deal of a lifetime, because the first customer is taking a real risk uh, to test a product. In my last session, we were talking with Chris Todd of Theatro, and, and he got Container Store to basically help him develop his product in the store. I'm sure it was painful for a couple of years, but they got the benefit of being the first mover on that incredible value proposition that theater has. So I'm, does that answer your question? I kind of talked yeah, around I it. Think, but, I mean, I think but I, um, I, it's a great point that, you know, you don't have, a startup doesn't have the, uh, you know, the legacy systems to manage through and that, you know, the, the best thing they can do is create an MVP to help get to customers ASAP, right? And create that test case. Okay, so yeah. let's, yeah. That leads me to let's pivot to some of the discussions around the business of entrepreneurship and what early stage leaders need to know about getting funding, competition, getting started and more. So let's talk about getting investors. So economic times are difficult. Um, and you mentioned there is more uh, demand than there is for supply. Right. So how is funding? Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how a funding has changed? You know, what's you know, is now the right time to get funding? I think we answered that earlier, which is yes. But what additional strategies do founders really need to think about, especially now to attract investors? Yeah, well, I think at the very beginning, it's as true now as it was 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, it's very normal to start with friends, family, and angels. Uh, people that really believe in you as an entrepreneur and people that really believe that what you're building and bringing to market, your value proposition, uh, needs to be brought to market. So I think friends, family, and angels will value the entrepreneur and the value proposition more strongly. Uh, but in a, in a time of a downturn, uh, angels are pretty quick to tighten up their wallet and, and dial down startup investing. So you saw like in March, April timeframe when there was some big market shock that um, that kind of angel funding went away for a little bit. Uh, I don't think venture funding 
uh, has that same effect because these are funds of committed capital that have to deploy that capital in a certain time frame. And uh, they're, if anything, they're licking their chops right now, thinking they can uh, find, you know, great teams and value propositions at low valuations right now, which may or may not be true. Um, so I don't think venture capital has dialed, uh, certainly dialed down this year. If you look at year on year stats, 2020 versus last year or the year prior. Um, but I think there, there's ample capital out there. I just say angels in times of an economic shock will temporarily close their wallets from my experience. And, and you have to catch them when they're feeling gr greedy and not when they're feeling scared. Hmm. Okay, good points. Um, are or how are startups successfully leveraging funding from the government relates to PPP and, and opportunities like that? Yeah, for, for our portfolio, um, PPP funding and EIDL um, loans were, were the biggest source of funding. We had, we had almost every active company in our portfolio, maybe four that didn't because of, um, because of um, uh, the cap table issues or, or maybe they didn't have employees last year yet as a baseline. Uh, but most of our portfolio did. I think we had over 6 million of, of uh, PPP funding. And, uh, and it, was, um, it, it was great for this year for um, not losing steam, right? It, it gave the confidence to not tighten up and reduce workforces when, when you're in building in growth mode. Uh, now, we didn't see um, a lot of uh, next rounds with our portfolio this year, but I think in part because um, many of them closed those rounds last year because valuations were really beginning to skyrocket. Um, but I, I do think, um, I, I do see more rounds coming to fruition now. So, so what? Yeah, it sounds like that question? you've got startups, uh, you know, using the government funds, using these opportunities to continue on their trajectory. And I think they all intend to make sure it's a grant and not a and not a loan, um, uh, by you know by maintaining the payroll base. Good point. Okay, good point. Um, what do you want founders to know simply around getting getting investment, getting investors at a time like this? Well, I think if you're starting early stage, it's it's more important than ever to really try to assemble people with depth of industry knowledge around the industry you're competing in. So if it, if it's if it is like a retail thing, RevTech's a great resource, or uh, there's resources on the West and East Coast. If it's healthcare related, like a Health Wildcatters can be a good avenue. I think it's really important early on. To, uh, to really find advisors, mentors, and investors that have uh, expertise uh, around your industry. And by the way, my, our, our accountant, Chase, who's on this session and helping us here, uh, reminds me that PPP proceeds are still not tax deductible, but, uh, but 70 cents on the dollar better than nothing, so. <laughs> Got it. Um, we wanted to talk about differentiation and competition, really, and how, you know, look, people are just a different, let's talk about something different for a minute. Uh, you know, people are busy, consumers are busy and distracted. Um, how, when, how does an entrepreneur really truly differentiate their product and brand value to the investment community and potential consumers? I think by ensuring they're meeting an unmet, unmet need, as you said earlier, Heather, I mean, yeah. That value proposition, uh, coupled with domain expertise on the part of the entrepreneur, those are the two biggest things we look for in most other early stage investors. We want to see a team that has domain expertise <clears throat> around what it is they're building, and, and we want to see a value proposition that has clear evidence of meeting an unmet need. Uh, our, our rule of thumb is it needs to be at least 10 times better than the next best alternative is kind of a rule of thumb. I like it. 10 X better. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Well, if we're, if we're an early stage investor, we certainly want to see something that has capability of having a 10 X return. And, and one helpful clue there is 
is a company that's got a value proposition that they can defend uh, and and um, and and scale uh, that um, that that is ten times better than the next best alternative. I sometimes say ten times better for a tenth, one tenth the price, but that that would be a hundred x improvement, and that's a pretty okay. tall order. Um, but most things, um, you know, most things we look at, we can put on a scale and 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 uh, and look for evidence of this. Is there measurable evidence that this solution is is um, a ten x improvement over what's currently available in this space? Okay. Something I would couple with that, though, that I've learned from Peter Thiel in this great book I always promote called Zero to One, uh, he really stresses the importance of, um, of a beachhead, of having a value proposition that you can identify who is the customer that will be most benefited from this value proposition. And usually that's a small sliver of an addressable market. It's a It's a set within an addressable market. But I think it's vitally important for startups to think about, you know, what what is that beachhead they can go out and get early that they can lock in and own because their value that they're bringing to that customer is is like, you know, yeah. life-saving. And, and a, a funny example of that, our newest investment, we just closed last week, um, uh, Ground Level Insights out of Toronto. They have a um, they have a platform that that helps physical locations know where their customers have been, kind of before, during, and after their visit to a physical space. And the first market they went after, which I just thought was brilliant, was cannabis, because here you have a market of of legal retail stores uh, that weren't legal just a few years ago. It was a black market, and so the data the cannabis industry has on its customers is uh, is very light to to nil and i just thought it was a brilliant like first prong of attack to go lock down the cannabis stores in north america and then expand outward from there that's great um okay so i guess look we've seen dramatic changes in retail uh what retail concepts and technologies are gaining the most success in the startup community i know you mentioned ai supply chain uh, store ops. Is there anything else you wanted to mention? No, I think um, I think re-commerce. Um, uh, understand the an analytics of where the customer is and what they're looking for. Um, that that's as important as ever. That's been a theme for a yeah. while now, and, and I, th I think that visibility to where your products are coming from. Uh, both from a health perspective and and um, and you know sustainability and morality perspective, frankly. No, those are great points. Um, I just have a one last open question, and I think uh, we've got some questions. We got time for Q and A. Uh, you know, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs wanting to start a retail business? I I think the time is right for you if you have a retail concept. Uh, I would say just get a proof of your concept with um, with a minimum valuable product and a customer that's benefiting from it. Even if it's in beta test, that's fine. Uh, but but try to get there with with you know little to no capital. And and if you have a model that you know could actually be customer funded and not even require capital, that's a wonderful thing. A customer funded business model where people will pay you for your service from day one uh, is the best funding you could have. It's absolutely non-dilutive. Uh, so so I, I would really encourage to get proof on the map before you, you go uh, carve out your time with raising capital and, uh, and carve up your ownership. Um, you know, if you have a path that you could scale something great, uh, and not give up that much, if any, ownership is wonderful. I mean, one of our early investments, Order My Gear, raised, I think, $650,000 total, and they scaled the company to um, over a $25 million net revenue uh, before they exited in a, recap, in a private equity recap. So it can be done. Wow. And I guarantee you the owner of that company, the founder of that company, owned a lot of the stock. 
having only raised six hundred fifty thousand dollars to scale it. Well, speaking of owners, what founders and owners do you admire most? Uh, well, obviously the ones in our portfolio because we believe in them enough to invest in them and support them. Um, but really, um, I mean, for current like big name entrepreneurs, it's the um, what they call the PayPal mafia. Uh, these people that came out of PayPal, which was a dot com survivor, while the dot com world imploded in the year two thousand, yeah. PayPal um, you know flourished. And and uh, and two people that came out of that, Peter Thiel, that's now taking Palantir public this week, um, and uh, Elon Musk are, are like two really really visionary entrepreneurs and uh, and clearly the way their stocks trade uh the market picks up on it they they are definitely skating to where the puck will be not where it is sure all right um i think we've got time for q a rachel you want to share some of the top questions yeah sure hey, hey rachel. long time no see um yeah right. if i shout art loud enough, you can probably hear me in, in David's office as well through his microphone. So, um, okay, so a few of the top questions and and David, maybe we can do rapid fire. But thoughts on micro mobility helping retail bounce back. Um, that's number one. Number two is as a brand that has only done e-commerce sales so far, how do you recommend entering into the physical retail space in light of COVID? Um, and then the third question is more general, but just more fun future of B2B commerce. So which one do you want to take first? Wow. I need, I need some definition around micro micro mobility. Joel, can you type in definition around micro mobility? And the other is like current state of, Oh, Okay. Things that you can uh, utilize um, uh, real time using by through mobile yeah, access. I think, yeah. Well, I think that wave of uh, scooters, bikes, and mopeds is is uh, playing through, um, but but certainly the ability to have your mobile device become more and more an advocate of where it grants you access to places you want to access. And for us at RevTech, that largely re in recent times has meant the automated store. Uh, if you go to an Amazon Go uh, or these type of stores, you your mobile device is literally your ticket to get you in, whether it's a QR code or, uh, or through the app. And, um, and, uh, and I really see that as a, as a gateway. And I guess e-bikes, e-mopeds were, were a vision of that but um but yeah i think our mobile device increasingly should be our protagonist it should be it should be working for us all day long to help us achieve our goals uh, and, and in commerce that means opening the doors for you and having you recognized as a loyal customer and get those kind of perks those type of things and Rachel, now I've completely blanked on the other two rapid fire. Uh, so the second one. Will shouting delivery drones at the top of his all caps typing. As, delivery drones. As a brand that has only done e-commerce sales so far, how do you recommend entering into the physical retail space in light of COVID? Which I thought was interesting because, you know, pre-COVID we were hyper-focused on helping D2C brands go in stores. And so... We're still seeing people do that, but in very different ways. So I thought that would be a really fun one. Yeah, I think I think like e-commerce brands we're invested in that we're starting to open physical stores have kind of slowed that path down, not surprisingly, and are amping up more e-commerce instead. Um, but I think I do see opportunity for products uh, insertion just like we've seen like product promotion in movies and TV shows for years. I think places you go that could have product insertion. Uh, and one example we've seen played out a little bit is like, um, um, like home away, your old company, Heather and, and, um, 
and uh, Airbnb, um, having product placement in those environments, when people stay there, they get turned on to new products and services. Awesome. And then last question, um, how are influencers affecting the retail business? I mean, I, it, I, retail is unregulated, so what the customer wants, the customer gets. That's, that's why we love retail so much, and that's why it changes so quickly. It's not regulated like uh, healthcare or military or education or other industries. Um, what the consumer wants, they get. So we've, we've had social media has been uh, one of the giant drivers of uh, changes in, in retail commerce models. And, uh, you know, just take reward style right here in Dallas, um, an early mover in that. So, so I, I, think, I think the fact that retail is unregulated and can change in a snap of a finger uh, is a beautiful thing from that aspect. And Heather might have a take on that yeah, too. Yeah, I was going to say, because I mean, I think they're, I mean, they're clearly a key point, a key piece of strategy and social commerce is becoming so uh, significant in the retail experience and the consumer experience, right? They're driving, you know, acquisition, but then also creating another path and another way to connect with the consumer. And then, you know, like things like what Nordstrom's doing and pulling the influencers into their own commerce experience into the app. Uh, it's pretty interesting to see, you know, just the integration between social channels and then pulling that content, that social content into the digital experience is it's pretty interesting. And then in store, right, into pop ups or, you know, uh, influencer engagement. But it's, you know, their role is I think, significant in, you know, driving engagement and really understanding what consumers want and bringing bringing a product to life in new ways that, you know, is is more difficult in a traditionally just you know mobile or, or in-store channel yeah i want to give a shout out to joel martin he is like this real-time fact checker that is a, that is amazingly <laughs> keeping us honest here been fantastic yeah we're at time david thank you for sharing the sharing the knowledge today thank you so much for doing sure. this heather great session and um, look forward to getting to know what you're doing at Accenture more with the products South lead. Sounds great. Sounds like we got some good discussion. Have a good day. All right. All right. Bye.